Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody for uh, to this keynote talk for our 2021 uh, Joint Southeast Asia Centers from UCLA and Berkeley's uh, Conference on Ethnic and Community Identity in Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker today, Professor Ardith Tongmong. She's the professor and chair of the Department of Political Science at uh, the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. She is also the interim director of the Interdepartmental Degree Program in Peace and Conflict Studies. Uh, she is currently a Fulbright Public Policy Fellow for the 2021 academic year. Uh, Professor Tangmang received her PhD in political science from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She also has an MA in international relations from Yale University, uh, graduating three years after I did from that program. I was very happy to see that, Ardith. Um, broadly speaking, she's a specialist in Southeast Asia, which she approaches from a comparative political economy perspective with a particular focus on questions and complexities of ethnic politics in Myanmar. Professor Tangmong has held fellowships at the East-West Center in Washington, DC, at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies and the Asia Research Institute uh, in Singapore, as well as the Australian National University. She is the author of, among many other articles and book chapters, uh, Everyday Economic Survival in Contemporary Myanmar from the University of Wisconsin Press, uh, The Politics of Indigeneity in Myanmar and Asian Ethnicity, and The Politics of Everyday Life in 21st Century Myanmar in the Journal of Asian Studies. She has also written extensively on issues of elections, poverty, the ceasefire processes in Myanmar, and rural issues in Myanmar more broadly. Um, we are delighted she has consented to join us today to talk about her perspectives on the question of ethnic identity at a critical juncture in the history of modern Myanmar. Her talk today is entitled Identity Politics in Myanmar, Studying Minorities from the Perspective of Minority Scholar. Uh, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Tang Mong. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Durden, for your introduction. I would also like to thank Sarah and all organizers for this conference for having me here. It's such a pleasure and honor to be invited as a keynote speaker uh, at a conference that focuses on the topic that I'm deeply passionate about. So my talk mainly focuses on ethical and pragmatic challenges faced by academics, researchers, and graduate students who study et ethnic and community identity. I like to talk about three challenges I have faced over the past 20 years as someone who studies the politics of ethnic identities in Myanmar. And particularly, I want to focus on how our identity as a researcher and the topics of ethnic identity influence the nature of our research findings and can have profound policy and ethical implications on the community that we study. We all know that it's easier to measure the impact of scholarly research on academic and policy communities by looking at whether uh, our works are published in top tier journals and academic presses, uh, whether our works are cited by other researchers, such as in Google Scholar citations, or whether we can obtain competitive grants, and whether we can publish in media that target practitioners. Although the, the impact of scholarly work on the communities has not been studied systematically, this subject has received significant consideration for some time. For instance, we all know that most academic works are usually not easily accessible to ordinary audience and are confined to a small circle of people. In addition, several scholars also have talked about how the relationship with the communities were damaged by what they write about people who felt humiliated and betrayed by the way the researchers described them. Furthermore, other scholars also want about how grassroots response to our writing can alter our prediction about events or behavior. Christopher Howard, who is a political scientist, noted that, for instance, if someone predicts that the next terrorist attack on the US would originate from Yemen, certain well-armed individuals might move from Yemen to a different country. 
If someone predicted that a senator will lose her next election, she and her supporters might redouble their efforts to win. So also in Myanmar in 2014, I remember that there was a strong resistance by civil society organizations against the results of public opinions published by International Republican Institute, which show that public give credit to the government backed by Myanmar military for the slowly improving economy and infrastructure because it conflicted with the standard narrative of overwhelming public support for National League for Democracy, which was then the opposition party in the government. So today I would like to use this venue as an opportunity to consider and reflect on the kind of limitations and challenges we encounter as researchers who study ethnic and community identity. Many of you, I realize that you come from a variety of discipline. You look at different topics in different countries. You also use different research methods. So even though I will be talking about specific lessons that I have learned as a political scientist who study contemporary and sensitive information about ethnic politics in a very highly polarized country like Myanmar, you may find these lessons relevant regardless of your discipline. And in fact, you may have experienced or known or read about some of the things that I will be sharing. You will see that I do have clear positions on some issues, but on other issues, I'm still struggling to find appropriate actions and responses. So I hope that my talk will allow us to share and learn from each other's experience. I will start with a brief background of Myanmar and about myself and focus on and focus on three topics. The first one is limitations we face on the study of ethnic community identity. The second one is how we describe the community can have serious policy and ethical implications on the community. And the last one is the dilemma we face in taking appropriate role as a researcher when the community in questions are either victims of violations of human rights or when they themselves are perpetrators, supporter, sympathizer of these violations of human rights. Brief background about Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar is one of the most culturally, linguistically diverse countries in the world. Burman or Burma is the country's majority language group and constitutes about 70% of the populations. The rest of the people are divided among hundreds of minority groups. Uh, many of these minority groups historically felt marginalized by Burma's exclusive control of the country's civilian and military institutions. Since Myanmar gains independence from Great Britain, at least 40 minority ethnic organizations have taken arms against the state to fight for greater autonomy and independence, making the country one of the longest civil war and authoritarian rule in the world. Even though the country has experienced democratic reforms over the past 10 years, until military state a coup last week, the civil war has continued until today. Burma is predominantly a Buddhist country. Uh, most Burma are Buddhist, although there are minorities such as Rakhine, Shan, and Mon who are Buddhist, many ethnic Many ethnic minorities are Christians and Muslim. Christians constitute 6.2% and Muslim constitute about 4.3% of the populations, according to the official data. The government recognized only 135 language groups as national and indigenous race in Myanmar. And studies have already shown that these categories are arbitrary. According to official guidelines, Indigenous races are defined as people who settled before 1823, before the British territorial annexation of Myanmar, and they are automatically eligible 
for full citizenship. Those who do not believe, belong to this 135 groups are regarded as immigrants or foreigners. These groups generally include descendants of immigrants from territories that currently make up present um, China, India, Bangladesh, who arrived in great numbers during the British colonization of Burma in 19th century. They are eligible for second class citizenship known as associate or naturalized citizenship. These groups have faced various forms of discriminations in employment, in education, and citizenship. I will say, however, that people of Chinese origins have fared better relatively because of their higher socioeconomic status, because of their shared cultural features with Buddhists, and a willingness to assimilate into the dominant cultures of the Ma Buddhist population. Rohingya Muslim populations are the most vulnerable one and are considered by Myanmar's government and peoples alike as illegal immigrants. They're estimated, until recently, they're estimated to be over 1 million um, and constituted about a third of the populations in Rakhine State, which is dominated by Rakhine Buddhists. There are another estimated one million Rohingya people living outside of Myanmar. The most serious forms of violations against Rohingya occurred in 2017, following the outflow of around 700 of them into Bangladesh to flee atrocity committed by Myanmar armies in its retaliations against the Islamic, Islamic militant group, which had attacked the Myanmar's borders post. And Myanmar's army retaliations um, have resulted in widespread report of atrocities, rapes, killing and burning of villages, and accusations of Myanmar government committing genocide. To some extent, Myanmar shares some similar situations with its Southeast Asian neighbors, such as Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, in terms of this contentious and violent nature of ethnic politics. However, I would say that Myanmar is one of the most ethnically polarized and politicized country in Southeast Asia and in the world. I also have some unique situations that set me apart from foreign scholars who do research on Burma. I was born and raised in Myanmar. I belong to a minority group called Karen. Uh, and these are the Koreans are the second largest minority group in Myanmar, whose population is estimated to be between three to five million, depending on where you get the data. And Karen also has one of the oldest and largest armed resistance organizations known as the Karen National Union, KNU, that have fought against the government. However, I'm also a minority within a minority people in Burma. I was born of educated parents uh, and I was raised in a city which was relatively peaceful area of the country in Burma, in Burman dominated, dominated area. And I also interacted comfortably with majority Burma populations. In fact, I have a lot of best friends who are Burma. So my upbringing differs significantly from other Korean who grew up in rural areas, in contested areas, or in areas controlled by armed groups, or in refugee camps, where they face violence, poverty, and a lack of security and stability. In addition, unlike many Korean who are Buddhists, I'm Christian. Furthermore, I receive a PhD in America, and I have taught for many years in America. I'm also married to uh, a man who is a um, member of Chin, which is another minority ethnic group in Myanmar. So while it may seem like I'm talking about a very unique situation from a perspective of a very unusual scholar who does research on unusual country, I believe that some of you may have come across some similar situations 
uh, if not the same as I have gone through. First, I want to talk about the limitations we face as a researcher who study ethnic and community identity. We should always keep in mind that our research findings will always be either constrained and influenced by our identity, whether it is our ethnicity, whether our, it is our gender, um, sexual orientation, age, physical attributes, and status, as well as the identity of the people we study. Some physical features will allow us better access to the communities than others. For instance, in Myanmar, researchers who are Burma have had a difficult time doing research in minority areas due to the lack of trust in Burma. So one Burma researcher noted to me that she was rejected outright by an elderly man from Shan ethnic communities who said that he did not want to talk to any Burma because he did not trust them and that he hated them. Vice versa, researchers who are Muslims, people of South Asia origin, who have darker skin, they were met with similar level of hostility and suspicion by Burma residents. I vividly remember a situation where a local researcher I was about to bring to Rakhine State in 2011 was rejected by Rakhine Buddhist Civil Society group because he shares some similar physical features with ethnic Rohingyas. On the other hand, I also know a Korean Christian man who is a researcher um, who said that being a Korean Christian allow him to conduct research more easily among two hostile communities in Rakhine State. He said, Rakhine Buddhists consider me as brethren because we share similarities as oppressed minorities by the majority Burman. I can, he also said he can mingle with Muslims because he said the Muslims told him that their religions share some similarities. Some of you possess some physical features that would allow you to integrate into the local community more easily than others. So if you are of Asian origin, you might be able to intermingle or disappear in Southeast Asian communities without attracting too much attention than compared to, for instance, if you are a white, Caucasian, tall, yen researcher from the West. It will also depend on which region you're doing your research. For me, it was relatively easier for me to go among the Korean, but among non-Korean populations, among Burma populations and among government employees, I was often accused as a CIA spy due to my association with the United States. We should therefore always be cautious about the meaning that are attached to our identity because we are interacting with human beings who react to our presence differently depending on their expectations and depending on their past experiences. In addition to this, our ability to understand language and culture play a role in the nature and quality of our research findings. If you do not understand local language and culture, you will miss out a great deal. Some foreign researchers said it is not really a problem for them that they don't speak the language or the culture as long as they have a good translator. For the most part, yes, translators can give you general and accurate information but sometimes many important information could get mistranslated or get lost during the translation process. I was told by eyewitnesses who saw translators scolding respondents for their quote unquote wrong response and translators removing and revising words and sentences by respondents that the translators disagree with, especially something that shed negative lights on their groups and their community. 
I'd like to also talk a little bit about the effects of social media. Technology helps us become overly productive nowadays. Just 40 years ago, think about it, you need to go to the library to look for books. You have to manually write down everything. Nowadays, we can find and download information more easily online. There are also software programs such as Envivo, uh, Scrivener, that offer better ways to organize our notes and ana analysis. This availability of social media and email also allow us to have better and efficient communications with our respondents. In Myanmar, almost half of the populations now have access to Facebook. People use Facebook for almost everything in Myanmar. They use Facebook to communicate with each other, to obtain information, to organize group meetings. So, as a researcher, I can now assess a variety of information and people's opinion from Facebook, and I can communicate with people from Burma through messengers, um, which is free of charge. I remember when I was a graduate student, I was paying 200 to $300 a month for my phone bill just to talk to my parents in Burma. And recently, we know that Zoom platform has saved us a lot of costs and also allow group meeting and workshop to include people from different views and backgrounds who would not have felt comfortable attending these meetings in person. Zoom platform also allow us to conduct interview and focus group discussion. So instead of spending time in villages, you can use social media to study how group communicate with each other through social media. There have been studies about how Facebook has facilitated group unity or um, spread hate messages among ethnic communities. In fact, my own PhD student has looked at how Facebook allow minority groups in Myanmar uh, to use Facebook to preserve and promote their languages and to organize group activities through tools that are available in Facebook. Of course, there are some limitations and ethical challenges here. When you are a part of this network, you have to be careful of coding statements and using images that are meant only for the group and not for public consumption. Studies have also shown that social media further exacerbate tensions among groups by strengthening network of like-minded people against people who do not share our views. So you as a scholar need to be sure that you don't become the victim of the same situation by trying to include people beyond your network. At a personal level, you want to just associate yourself with people who share your views and positions. But, at, but as academics, you will have to be more inclusive and open-minded about diversities of opinion. And to tell you the truth, I find it very challenging and difficult sometimes. Another challenging thing about social media is that when you put on Facebook, what you put on Facebook, because your post is now available for people all over the world. So when people from one part of the world share posts about delicious food and fashions and spots, people from other parts of the world will be sharing posts about wars, displacement, natural disaster, military coup. So I have to be very careful about not putting joyful messages that are not sensitive to friends living in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, or posting certain political stance that I know people who are my friends, my colleagues, and people who help me with my research don't feel comfortable. The second challenge I want to talk about is the reactions in response to how we, the reactions from the community we study in response to how we describe these communities. We all know that people have multiple identities. 
some people identified themselves in terms of their ethnic or national, uh, gender, sexual uh, orientations, or professional backgrounds. In some traditional ethnic communities like Karen and Chin, uh, men and women are referred to as mother or father of their first child's name. So if your child is named, for instance, if your child's name is Paul, you will be referred to as the mother and father of Paul. We also know that identities change depending on the situations you are in. So in some case, I will identify myself as a citizen of a country, but in other contexts, I will identify myself as a member of ethnic group or in terms of my profession. However, we still tend to make generalizations about people's behavior based on their group membership. These perceptions manifested themselves in everyday practices as well as in academic writings. For instance, in Myanmar, uh, Bamar are seen by ethnic minorities as untrustworthy. Rakhine are seen as hot-blooded. Tin are described as sneaky and unscrupulous. Karen are referred to as naive and simple. Buddhists are conventionally seen as peaceful by the rest of the world. Of course, there may be some elements of truth in some of these generalizations. But as scholars, we know that there are attributes that are unique to individuals that do not confirm these generalizations. I want to give you an example of the concept of Burmanization. The concept of Burmanization is used widely in academic discipline, as well as among ethnic communities in Myanmar, to refer to practices uh, that attempt to subsume non burman minority ethnic groups under the identity of majority Burman. However, the identity of Burman has never been studied thoroughly. Who are the Burmans? If you talk to many people who call themselves Burman, you will see that many of them are of mixed ethnicities. In addition, they come from diverse regions. They have different positions and understanding of minority groups. Some Burmen, in fact, resented these broad generalizations that does not represent them as individuals. This is also true for minority ethnic groups. The Korean people are associated with one of the most repressed people in Myanmar, and Koreans are associated with the KNU that has taken up arms against the central government to fight for greater autonomy since 1949. However, there are about 10 Korean sub-language groups who speak mutually and intelligible dialects and they come from diverse religious, social, economic, and geographic backgrounds. The majority of Korean have lived quietly under the military regime and have resorted to non-violent strategies to address their individual and collective needs. In addition, I have seen cases where current siblings from the same parents who share completely different political viewpoints or display different level of nationalistic sentiments. I'm also a friend of two siblings whose mother is Karen and whose father is Kachin which is another ethnic minority group in the country. But one adopts Gachin identity completely and married to a Gachin, and the other adopts Karen identity completely and marry Karen. I have done research and published a good deal on these quote unquote quiet Karens based largely on my experience of growing up as a member of Karen minority ethnic group. My objectives are to shed light on the roles and activities of Karen who do not join armed resistant movement um, and who have been neglected by the policy and academic communities. And my other objective is to analyze the divisions within these groups and their political implications and to suggest some 
policy responses that are sensitive to the needs of the diverse members of ethnic communities in Burma and elsewhere. So in my book on the other Karen, I argue that where a person was born or raised was an important predictor of whether individuals were likely to join armed movement. I found that those who join armed resistance are predominantly from areas under the control of armed groups or contested area that have experienced high levels of violence. On the other hand, Karen people who did not join armed resistance tend to be from urban and government control areas. But there are exceptional cases. In the current armed movement, you find educated people from urban areas. There are also refugees and people who are internally displaced Karen who do not join armed resistance movement. One example I want to give is Noa, uh, who is a friend of mine, but this is not her real name. She's now in her 30s and she resettled in the U US. Most of her relatives were in current armed resistance movement. These include her grandfather, who was a prominent military figure in the KNU, and who never hid his extreme hatred for the Burmese. Or Burma. He reportedly sh said shortly before his death, he said, I hated Burmese. Even if I cannot walk, I still want to shoot and fight Burma. This level of hatred is understandable given a long period of suffering and violence that he endured during the conflict with the Burmese army. All three of his sons joined the KNU and the two younger ones were 17 and 30 years old when they were killed in battles. His oldest son was arrested by the Myanmar military for his alleged support for the KNU. The next morning, the army delivered his body, wrapped in plastic to his family, claiming that he had committed suicide. He was only 40 years old when he died, leaving a pregnant wife an eight-year-old son who later joined the KNU. This is understandable. So given her long family history of suffering at the hands of Burman army, it still puzzles me why my friend Noah, who was only six years old when she left her village for a refugee camp where she was spent another 11 years before being resettled to the US would have such a forgiving attitude. She said, I don't like the way the Burman army abused Karen people, but we cannot continue hating them. This cycle will never end and will hurt the people more. If there is peace in Karen areas, living conditions will improve. Therefore, it is very important that we as scholars don't categorize individuals based on their group membership, and that we pay attention to the diversities and opinions among them. And to do so will be to do justice to individuals who do not conform to generalizations. Several scholars on Southeast Asia have already talked about how conventional studies about armed movement tend to be based on elite members of the armed movements. One example I can give you is Thomas Mackinnon's book on Muslim rulers and rebels, which is based on anthropological works on unseparatists and separatism in the southern Philippines. For instance, it shows that a gap in understanding it shows a gap in understanding about armed rebellion, armed rebellion between rank and file soldiers on the one hand and leaders of our movement on the other hand. He finds that ordinary members uh, typically were primarily concerned with their local community and they joined our movement to defend themselves and their communities against the murderous behavior of the Philippine government soldier. They were not particularly motivated by the calls by their leaders to fight for an independent state. 
However, while we as scholars can advance our knowledge about the, these diverse opinions that exist within a particular community, we must be cautious that our descriptions and interpretations can affect relationships we have with the community that we study. So while I was collecting data and interviewing people for my research on Karen, I was warned by some Karen nationalists that I would suffer the consequence if I write negative things about armed resistance movement. When the book came out, some members of the Korean community alleged that I treated Korean who did not join armed resistance as superior to the ones who joined armed resistance movement because my book focuses on the former. Some reportedly felt uncomfortable about the way I shed light on the divisions that exist within Korean groups or the way I questioned the uncertain future of the armed movement, even though these issues have already been addressed in other venues and acknowledged by armed group leaders themselves. Some call me unpatriotic, someone who sold out Korean people and alleged that I wrote bad things about Korean. The publications of my work, which is exclusively in English, also proved to be a limiting factor. I have come across many people who are fluent in English, but who for whatever reason mistranslated and misunderstood my main arguments. At the same time, I found that people, Korean people who are outside of the armed movement, such as government employees, government servants, leaders of political parties, have used my work to justify their position as superior to the people who join armed resistance movement. Even some scholars on Burma remarked that studies like mine, which look at intra-group conflicts, could deflect attention, could distract us from the Burmese military, which is the real source of the problem in the country. So all of these unexpected criticisms make me think about whether it is worth continuing to research and publish on Karen. If my work ends up creating further divisions or legitimizing certain groups. So, but I still don't know what I would have done differently in light of these responses that I received. But I definitely have become more careful to take into consideration about how my writing could provoke certain kinds of responses from certain segments of that community. The third and last challenge I want to talk about is the appropriate role we should play as scholar. When the community we study have become other victims of violations of human rights or when they themselves are perpetrators, supporters, or sympathizers of these violations of human rights. I would like to give you an example of exodus of Rohingyas into Bangladesh as a way to discuss the role and responsibility of scholars on the conflicts. Looking from outside, Rohingya crisis seems to be a clear case of human rights violations. It seems like we as scholars should speak up. But in reality, however, this crisis presented scholars with a difficult dilemma because of a huge gap of perceptions between international communities and Myanmar citizens. And because most scholars have established personal and professional relationships with non-Rohingya communities, a majority of whom are hostile to Rohingyas. Many foreign researchers were in fact shocked by the, by the reactions from the community they established close personal relationship with. Um, they were shocked by the reactions of the community that they established close personal relationship with, which made their public stance very complicated. One graduate student who worked among current communities said, she found it very difficult to reconcile her experience of Burmese people as unbelievably kind and generous, but who now support and justify the same tactics 
that the military has used against their very people for generations. While international communities see this as a clear violation of human rights, as a clear case for minorities who are eligible for citizenships, local populations in Myanmar see Rohingya as immigrant people from Bangladesh who pose economic, cultural, and political threat to Myanmar. Most of the scholars I have talked to remain quiet because they don't feel like they have enough expertise. Uh, Jack Leider, uh, who is a historian who has spent 25 years studying the early modern history of Rakhine, Bay of Bengal and the border region, said that there is a lack of historical and anthropological academic research on Muslims going back to 500 years. And he noted the absence of shared, balanced, and commonly agreed background information on Rakhine State. So many scholars think that taking side is unproductive, given the complexity of the issues. And they don't feel like they add any information to the debates because the information have been shared and made known to the general audience. Rohingya issues is, in fact, very complicated. It is not just about human rights issue. It's also a touches on various legal issues, whether they should be considered as indigenous populations, whether they should be eligible for full citizenship. Other scholars, however, take a more activist role, proposing for academic disengagement and emphasize that Academic responsibility is to speak out against the atrocities. And some scholars not only speak out against the atrocities, but also name and shame others for not openly speaking out against the atrocities. Dr. Jacques Leider came under criticism for talking about the constructive identity of Rohingyas from an academic perspective and for sitting next to a military general in a panel without questioning their mass violence and atrocities against the Rohingyas communities. In 2016, 1,689 signatures were signed by academics and activists to protest against a plan by Oxford University Press to publish a paper about Rohingya by Dr. Jack Leider. They allege him to be quote unquote biased and have close links to Myanmar brutal military. However, uh, many of the scholars, including myself, consider these criticisms treated very unfairly and fail to appreciate the depth and careful analysis of his scholarship. Dr. Leider told me after the publications of the article, there has been no comment, no critical engagement, no relaunch of that campaign by any of these people. However, he said that this has a very long lasting emotional and damaging impact on him and his family. It was obviously disturbing for him since it was the first time for him as academic uh, to come under what he regard as and justify fire. And he also mentioned that before 2012, nearly no one in the world was interested in Rakhine issues. He, for his part, does not think that any of the Rakhine or Rohingya read what he write, uh, besides you know, some of the interviews that are translated into Burmese. Uh, because of the world of understanding of our academic writing is too high. Nor does he think that the human rights activists who attacked him based on some assumed political, supposedly immoral stance ever read what he wrote. He therefore um, noted that, quote, it is the person who gets shamed and bedeviled by one side and appraised by the other 
because of the assumptions which seem to float beyond the academic role. This is very unfortunate. So why I will not be suggesting taking one position on the, or the other, I would say that the approach we'll take, the approach that we take will ultimately depend on who we are. But we should also try to understand the positions of others and restrain ourselves from quickly criticizing others who do not share our views and positions for a variety of reasons that we do not know. Of course, Rakhine situation represents the extreme example of a dilemma over appropriate role scholarship play in policy and public relations field. But as someone who engage and work on community and ethnic identity, you need to ask yourself, have you prepared? Are you prepared to deal with the communities uh, when you see that they mistreat their women, when you see they abuse their children, or when you see that they say or do things that would endanger the lives, the well being, and safety of other community members? In conclusion, I will say this, academics are well positioned to engage in public by contributing knowledge, drawing comparative insights from elsewhere, providing critical evaluations and assessment. We scholars are supposed to be non-biased, we're supposed to be objective, but we all have some degree of predepositions to our certain values, um, preferences, depending on how we race, how we are trained, and the culture and social political environment under which we're exposed to and our personality. What we write are influenced by who we are and the nature of our interactions with the people we study. And what we write can have very varying implications on the community we study. Dr. Jet Leiter also noted that any kind of academic knowledge is a co-production because we as scholars cannot disassociate our work from who we are and because socially useful knowledge can only be co-produced by discussion, dialogue, struggle, and ongoing tensions between academic outputs and conclusions. Of course, it is difficult to predict how communities will respond to our scholarly work given the divisions within any given community and the likelihood that the work will produce multiple interpretations that were never intended by the writer. But given the advantage we enjoy in terms of reaching a substantial number of audience, we should constantly engage in self-reflection and exercise caution in our interpretations and conclusions. What we think is acceptable for scientific guidelines, scientific research methods may not necessarily be considered appropriate and acceptable for the community. While we have very little control over and cannot foresee how, we, how people will react to our work, I like to conclude by saying that researchers should at least try to balance the desire to be critical with the appreciation of the potential impacts their work can have on grassroots communities. Thank you very much.